Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the serotonin receptors. Okay, right. Uh, so, we've now discussed the G-protein cycle, we've discussed all of the different heterotrimeric G-proteins. What we now want to discuss is what the different families of uh, serotonin receptors actually are coupled to. So, let's just remind ourselves of the different families of serotonin receptors again. So, remember we had seven families. We had the 5-HT1 family, which contained six receptors. The 5-HT1A receptor, all the way down to the 5-HT1F receptor. Okay, so you have the 5-HT1B, the 5-HT1C, the 5-HT1D, the 5-HT1E, and then finally the 5-HT1F. Absolutely all of these six receptors are all G-protein coupled receptors, and they are all coupled to a GI heterotrimeric G-protein, which means that the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G-proteins they activate is always an alpha I subunit. So their activation results in an inactivation of adenylyl cyclase enzymes. Okay, right. Then let's go on to the 5-HT2 family of serotonin receptors. Okay, so remember this family contains three members. We have the 5-HT2A what? Sorry, 2A this time, 2A, all the way down to the 5-HT2C um, receptor. Okay, and these three receptors that are in this 5-HT2 family, they are all coupled to the GS heterotrimeric G protein. Oh, sorry, not GS, they're coupled to GQ. Okay, so they're all coupled to the GQ heterotrimeric G protein, which means that the alpha subunit of the heterotrimeric G protein they activate is always the G alpha Q subunit, and that leads to the activation of phospholipase C beta pathway and then the phosphonositide pathway. Right. Uh, then the 5-HT3 receptor is a ligand-gated iron channel family, so we'll come back to those. Okay, so let's skip on to the 5-HT4 family, and remember there was only one receptor within the 5-HT4 family, which was the 5-HT4 receptor. This uh, is coupled to um, the GS heterotrimeric G protein. Okay, so its alpha subunit will be the G alpha S protein. Okay. Then we have the 5-HT5 family of um, serotonin receptors, and this, remember, only contained one member in humans, which was the 5-HT5A receptor. This receptor is a GI-coupled receptor. Okay, so like the 5-HT1 family, it will also activate heterotrimeric G proteins which have a alpha I subunit, so either G alpha I1, G alpha I2, or G alpha I3, and therefore it will lead to the inactivation of adenylyl cyclase enzymes. Okay, right. Then we have the 5-HT6 family and the 5-HT7 family, which only contained one member each, 5-HT6 receptor and the 5-HT7 receptor, both of these two receptors are also coupled to the GS heterotrimeric G protein, i.e. their activation uh, will lead to the activation of a heterotrimeric G protein whose alpha subunit is a G alpha S protein. Okay, so that's what these different types of serotonin receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors, actually couple to, basically. These are the heterotrimeric G-proteins which they work through. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of the serotonin receptors, which are G-protein coupled receptors. I should just say one last thing, that the main presence of serotonin receptors is within the central and peripheral nervous system, especially the central nervous system. Occasionally you can find them in the gut as well, on smooth muscle. Okay, uh, right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about 5-HT3 receptors. Okay, which are different from all the rest because these are not G protein coupled receptors. Instead, these are ligand gated iron channels. Okay, and for short, ligand gated iron channel is often abbreviated to LGIC. In fact, actually, I think I'd better get a new piece of paper because I'd like this all to be on one page and uh, I'm not going to be able to fit it in there. 
Okay, right, so let's move on over here. So, let's now discuss the 5-HT free receptors, and it's not just one receptor, it's a family of receptors. So there are multiple 5-HT free receptors. Okay, so let's start off with what the structure of these are. Okay, so basically, it's always a good idea when you're drawing an ion channel to start off by drawing a cylinder. Okay, so this is going to represent our ion channel. And basically, 5-HT3 receptors fall into a superfamily of ligand-gated ion channels known as the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels, or they're also called nicotine-like receptors. Okay, so there's a, within the family of ligand-gated ion channels, okay, there is uh, three major superfamilies, basically. Okay, and these three major superfamilies are the P2X-like receptors, okay, which we're not going to be interested in. Okay, so I'll just pull this out a little bit. P2X-like receptors, okay, which contains receptors uh, such as the P2X receptors. Then there is the glutamate-like receptors, which contains uh, the ionotropic glutamate receptors. So the AMPA, the Knate, and the NMDA receptors. And then finally, there is this final family of ligand-gated ion channels known as the nicotine-like receptors. Okay, And this contains things like the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, the GABA-A receptors, and also the 5-HT3 receptors. Okay, and the old name for this massive great superfamily of ligand-gated ion channels was to call it the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, and for the first part of this discussion, what I say actually will apply for all cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, so these 5-HT3 receptors are pentamers. They're made up of three separate proteins which have all joined together. Now, that is true for all nicotine-like receptors, that they are pentameric, okay, or cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels, whichever name you prefer, okay? Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out one of these subunits that makes up a fifth of the 5-HT3 receptor. Okay, so that we can have a look at its membrane-spanning topology. So let's draw the membrane here. And what then happens is the amino terminus of the polypeptide is extracellularly. And then you have a large structure extracellularly known as the cis loop. So this line represents the polypeptide. And we're talking about subunits of the 5-HD3 receptor here. However, it all applies exactly the same to all these other types of receptor which are in this superfamily of cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels. Okay, they all have this pentameric structure, and the subunits will all have the same basic core structure, even though they'll obviously all have different fundamental sequences of amino acids. Okay, so I want to discuss what a cis loop is in a little bit more detail, because after all, this is why they're called cis loop ligand gated ion channels. Okay, so let's draw this out in a bit more detail down here. So this line is representing a polymer of amino acids. So it represents amino acid after 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 amino acid. Now, at some point, in this strand here, this is what we're drawing, you will have a cysteine amino acid. So let me show you the structure of a cysteine amino acid residue. And this residue is going to be privileged. It's going to actually have its full structure drawn out. Okay? So here is the core amino acid structure. And then the R group of a cysteine amino acid will consist of a methylene group with a thiol group coming off. Now, thiol groups usually consist of a sulfur atom bound to a hydrogen atom like so. Okay, and they have similar chemical properties to alcohol groups because sulfur is in the same group of the periodic table as oxygen and therefore has similar chemical properties to it. And if this was an oxygen, we'd call that an alcohol group. So we will guess that this thiol group has similar properties to the alcohol group. So we're going to take the hydrogen off this sulfur atom because it's going to be involved in a disulfide bond to another sulfur atom. Okay, so that's why I'm not drawing that. And then the polypeptide will continue round, like so. And then on the 
parallel strand here, you'll have another cysteine residue. So let me draw this here. Here's the amino group. Here's the alpha carbon with the hydrogen coming off it. Here's the carboxylic acid group. And then the R group of the cysteine residue consists of a methylene group with then a thiol group coming off it. And again, I've taken the hydrogen off this thiol group. And now I'm going to draw, well, I'm going to connect those two sulfurs together. And this link between those two sulfur atoms there, this is known as a disulfide bond or a disulfide bridge. And this is what holds uh, the polypeptide in this loop structure known as the cis loop. That's why it's called a cis loop, because it's a loop in the polypeptide structure that is held together by two cysteine residues. Cis, like so, is short for cysteine. It's the three-letter amino acid abbreviation for cysteine. So this is a loop in the polypeptide structure that is held together by a disulfide bond between two cysteine residues on the two parallel strands, basically. Okay, and all cis loop ligand gated iron channel subunits uh, of the pentaba will have one of these in their extracellular domain here. Okay, then we have the first membrane spanning alpha helix, the second membrane spanning alpha helix, a third membrane spanning alpha helix, a large intracellular loop, a fourth membrane spanning alpha helix, and then the carboxylic acid terminus over here. Okay, so let me give you some notation regarding the different portions of this subunit structure then. Okay, so the, let's begin with the four membrane spanning alpha helices. Okay, so the first one here is called tr transmembrane domain 1 or TM1. Then the second one is TM2, the third one TM3, and then the fourth one TM4. So we have TM1 through to TM4. We then, of course, have the cis loop here, which is an extremely important structure, okay, after which the entire superfamily of ligand gated ion channels is named. And then Finally, we have this loop in between TM3 and TM4 in orange here, and this is what's known as the intracellular loop. Okay, and for short, the intracellular loop is often abbreviated to the ICL. So this is also called the I for intracell, sorry, intra, and then C for cellular, and then L for loop. Okay, right. So this is the basic core structure that you're always going to find for 5-HT3 receptor subunits. In addition, everything I've just told you also applies for all of the receptors that are in this massive great superfamily of ligand-gated ion channels called the cis-loop ligand-gated ion channels or the nicotine-like receptors. They are all pentameric ion channels which have got uh, subunit structures that look like so. So the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors, their subunits look like this as well. Okay, the GABA-A receptors, their subunits look like this. The glycine receptors in the spinal cord, their subunits look like this. Okay, so this would go, you know, this goes far beyond just the 5-HT3 receptors, but we're looking at it uh, in view of the 5-HT3 receptors. This sort of a structure does not apply for the glutamate-like receptors or the P2X-like receptors. They have very different structures. Okay, right. So, um, okay, so the 5-HT3 receptors, they are pentamers like this, and their subunits look like this. Okay, so how many different types of subunits of 5-HT3 receptors are there in humans? Well, the simple answer would be if there was just one and you made five of them, stuck them all together, and you then have a 5-HT3 receptor. It's not that simple. Instead, you have five known genes for 5-HT3 receptor subunits called the 5-HT3A uh, gene, the 5-HT3B gene, and therefore the corresponding 5-HT3B subunit, and then it goes on all the way down to 5-HT3E. Okay, so that gives us five in total. Right, the 5-HT3C, 5-HT3D, and 5-HT3E uh, subunits of 5-HT3 receptors they have not been found yet, as far as I'm aware, to be expressed within cells, okay? We have the genes for them, but we don't know if they're actually doing anything within the human body. 
But the 5HT3A subunit and the 5HT3B subunit, these two are very important. Okay, so these are the two we know are expressed within human cells. Okay, well, within certain human cells at least. Okay, so then the question comes, we can build these two proteins, which will have a membrane-spanning topology like so, and they will be slightly different, you know, they're not going to be identical. They will both have this core structure, but they'll have different primary sequences of amino acids. The question then is, how can we uh, pentamerize these together to make a full 5-HT3 receptor? Well, one way is that you can pentamerize five 5-HT3A uh, receptor subunits together to make a 5-HT3A homopentamer. Okay, so if you make five 5-HT3A subunits and join them all together to make a homopentamer, that's called the 5-HT3A homopentamer. And the reason it's called the homopentamer is homo means the same. Pentamer means five subunit structure, so it means that the five subunits you're using to make the pentamer are exactly the same. Okay, now the only other type of 5-HT free receptor that then is found is a heteropentamer in which you have both 5-HT3A and 5-HT3B subunits. Okay, so you can also find something known as the 5-HT3A, 5-HT3B heteropentamer. And these are the only known 5-HT free receptors in humans. Okay, so either you can find 5-HT free receptors which are completely composed of 5-HT3A subunits, or you can find 5-HT3 receptors which have a mixture of 5-HT3A subunits and also 5-HT3B subunits. Now, I also don't know whether it's been discovered what the stoichiometry of these is, okay? So I don't know whether you include one 5-HT3A subunit and four 5-HT3B subunits or two 5-HT3A subunits and three 5-HT3B subunits. I don't know if that's known. I don't think it is, okay? And I certainly don't think that the arrangement of the subunits relative to one another is known. Okay, I think all we know is that you can either find receptors which are all 5-HT3A subunits, or you can find ones which are a mixture of both 5-HT3A subunits and 5-HT3B subunits. Now, both of these types of 5-HT3 receptors then are um, ion channels when they open. Okay, so what will happen is five serotonin molecules will come along one will bind to each of the 5-HT3 receptor subunits, because we have three subunits, we therefore have, sorry, we have five subunits, we therefore have five binding sites for serotonin. So five serotonin molecules will bind, that will trigger the uh, ion channel to open, and when it opens, it will conduct both sodium ions and potassium ions. Sodium ions will move into the cell, and a few potassium ions will move out of the cell. So overall, when you open these channels, you get a net movement of positive charge into the cell, okay? And that produces a depolarizing current. So when you open these 5-HT3 receptors, the net effect is to depolarize the cell membrane, okay? And that's because the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane of around negative 65 millivolts uh, that drives sodium to move into the cell because sodium wants to get to where the electrical potential is lower, which is in the intracellular compartment. So the concentration gradient of sodium also points into the cell. So the electrical gradient and the concentration gradient for sodium work together, whereas for potassium, the concentration gradient says move out because potassium is higher inside the cell than out whilst the electrical gradient says move in because it's got a lower electrical potential inside. So that hugely weakens the amount of potassium that moves out. Only a tiny amount will move out, which means more sodium will move in than potassium will move out. And therefore you'll get a net movement of positive charge into the cell, which will depolarize the electrical potential difference across the cell membrane. Okay, so that now concludes our discussion of serotonin receptors.